Hello and welcome to the World Bank Group headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm Noriana Fernando and you are watching The Zone. This is the last day of our spring meetings with the IMF on reshaping development for a new era. In the next half an hour, we will hear from a brilliant lineup of guests, including the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. I will also be looking back on the week with Raj Kumar from the development media organization DevEx. So let's get into the zone. And remember, it is not too late to join the conversation using the hashtag reshaping development. Now let us start with one theme of the week, overcoming debt and generating growth. Now debt has been has reached a 50 year high in developing countries and it's hurting efforts to reduce poverty. Tackling this issue has been a big focus of David Malpass's presidency. At a news conference on Thursday, he said that the World Bank and its partners could build on the G20's efforts around debt relief and restructuring for low-income countries. The G20's common framework process sought to get that started, but we've looked, we, uh, World Bank and IMF, have looked for ways to improve the G20 process so it would be more timely, actually move the process along, and actually reach a, a, a result in terms of uh, debt sustainability for the countries. So there's still a lot of work to be done, and, and the, and the, the, uh, uh, the, Addressing debt frees resources for developing countries to invest in key areas. But the private sector also has a role to play in getting development back on track. Here's Amit Buri from the Global Impact Investing Network to explain more. Hi, my name is Amit Buri. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Global Impact Investing Network, or the GIN for short. If you're interested in development finance, you should be aware of impact investing. Um, we define impact investments as investments that are made to achieve a positive, measurable social or environmental impact alongside a financial return. In practice, this means private investors putting capital to work to invest in things like increasing access to affordable housing, access to clean energy, financial services, you're helping to support natural capital solutions, investing in things like clean energy and beyond. Impact investments are taking place all over the world. From our network, we see activity on six continents uh, in over 50 countries. And in practice, it means that people are putting capital to work to address you know, key issues um, that are facing communities in the planet. ESG and impact investing are becoming more popular all around the world. They're both very important when we think about sustainable finance, but they are different. Um, here's how I would define their differences. Um, ESG is very much focused on how do you incorporate a number of considerations around environmental, social, and governance factors in a way that allows investors to manage risk, but also to pursue some opportunities for value creation. Impact investing is related, but it's different in that it is focused on a specific goal or outcome, a development goal, if you will. So if investors are trying to both achieve their financial objectives and specifically targeting a, an impact goal, such as promoting gender equity, increasing financial inclusion, helping to drive a transition towards more sustainable and regenerative agriculture, that's where impact investing comes into play. We're actually setting a goal and managing your performance towards an impact objective and a financial objective. The World Bank and IFC are convening critical conversations about how we address global issues like climate change and poverty. Impact investing can be part of the solution. Specifically, impact investors are putting capital to work with a specific target around addressing an issue like mitigating climate change, supporting climate adaptation, or addressing poverty alleviation in any number of ways. And by putting that capital to work to invest in businesses and projects that will help us achieve um, those goals and help us to close the financing gap towards the achievement of the SDGs. Amit Bori ending there on the sustainable development goals. But how are we doing on those SDGs amid multiple global crises? Well, the UN's Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed shared her thoughts with my colleague Anu Palan. 
Well, sadly, uh, we're not in a very good place where the SDGs are concerned. Um, seven years later, we're not meeting any of the targets. Uh, we will have the stock take this year. It will look to see how far we've gone, where the gaps are, and what we need to do in the next seven years to get to, to the promises of the SDGs. Um, for the world, the crisis, of course, has compounded many of the efforts that were made. We've reversed many um, of, the, of the progress we've had on gender, on human rights, on jobs, and, and all this has been exacerbated by COVID. And now, of course, the war in Ukraine, uh, the impacts of that um, in developing countries. Um, nevertheless, crisis is one thing having the solutions to address it. And the framing of the SDGs is still as relevant today as it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. It's what brings people around the table. They find their place in the responses that they need mm -hmm. to the social economic crisis. Um, and that's, I think, the, the plus for us. It's to get people again around the table. Now, the challenge is that we have to go from the billions to the trillions. And that's where uh, the discussions in uh, Washington, the discussions at the spring meetings, are really important um, to finding that way and that pathway to, to fuel uh, what we have to do to get back on track. And to pick up on that point, the UN has uh, come up with the SDG stimulus, um, the point about the SDG stimulus and needing that SDG stimulus yes. um, this March, just a couple of, just maybe a month ago. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What's the vision for it? Yeah. Well, this is the SG's offer uh, to the G20. Uh, because what we're looking at is to say, where are the means of implementation? Where are the barriers to us getting the resources that we need for developing countries? Particularly when many have seen the response in COVID in the north of our world and developed countries happened. It didn't happen in the south. Um, with the impacts of Ukraine, it's the same thing. So we are looking for a way to balance this. And the SDG stimulus does that by addressing debt and the restructuring that is needed for many countries now who are facing a debt crisis through no fault of their own, um, and there are over 60 of them, um, as I say, on debt row, it will also look um, at liquidity. How can we make um, accessible uh, finance to these countries at affordable and longer term uh, conditions? Um, and third, the reforms. What needs to happen with what we have now, the IFIs, the, the MDDs? Um, and in the longer term, you'll see from our common agenda that the uh, international financial architecture that we feel needs to be completely revamped um, will be a, a, a second step for it. But in the stimulus, let's see what we can do with the debt restructuring. Let's see how we can open up more uh, in terms of liquidity. Uh, it includes looking at the bank, at the banks, leveraging uh, your own um, uh, uh, muscle to get more money from the private sector and more lending. Uh, there are many initiatives that uh, have been put on the table as a result of that. Um, and in particular here, maybe mentioned the African Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, who are looking at the SDRs that could be rechanneled. Good news today when we hear Japan talk about 40% of their SDRs uh, are coming to development. So really important that the SDG stimulus is not facing any one crisis or the other. It's saying to you that overall sustainable development is in trouble. We're not meeting the goals. And these are some of the things that we can do more immediately. So just picking up on that point about the, the role the World Bank can play, yes. especially this week, the UN and the World Bank have been partnering at the country level and at the global level on accomplishing and attaining the SDG goals. Um, where do you think this partnership is working well? And what more do you think we could be doing together? We're, we're very fortunate that the partnership between the bank and, and the UN has been very solid. And we've been able to work um, in many places in Yemen, more recently in Pakistan, when we had to have um, a, a response very quick to a huge climate catastrophe um, and seeing how that turned around really quickly. So our relationships, both in coming together globally to find the response that's needed and then even better to on the ground have a division of labor that we are addressing the climate crisis, we are addressing conflicts in humanitarian settings. What we would like to see um, going forward is how do we do this um, with a much deeper integrated response to development. Um, it is beyond the two goals. The two goals for the bank are poverty and prosperity. We're missing the environment and climate piece. Um, and, and, and so let's bring them all together. Sustainable development is about uh, social, it is about the economy, it's about the environment. So bringing that DNA together um, into our work, I think um, the, the opportunities now are when the bank comes to look at the evolution roadmap. 
How do we frame that? Uh, what is the ambition of it? Uh, what are the roles and responsibilities? How, how, as a international community and family, do we come uh, to give the best support possible for countries in, in, in a more coordinated and coherent manner? Thank you so much, Amina. Welcome. That was Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Amina Mohammed touched on broadening the World Bank's mission to include global public goods. Climate is one, health another. And as we have just seen, the institution deployed billions of dollars in its COVID-19 response. But what is being done to prepare against future shocks? Well, Dr. Ahmed Ogwell Uma is the acting director of the Africa CDC. He is also on the board of the Pandemic Fund, a multilateral partnership set up last year and hosted in this building. It is designed to prevent. It is not designed to just respond. And so building that capacity uh, on the continent will mean that we are better at uh, picking up uh, outbreaks early and we are better at um, uh, institutions that can move to respond quickly. The way we see the Pandemics Fund supporting the continent is in addressing priorities that we have identified. Mm -hmm. There are cross-cutting priorities uh, like uh, the one I described of workforce development, very important on the continent, uh, building a network of laboratories that can be used for diagnosis of any new pathogen that comes into place, and also strengthening early warning systems. So the Pandemics Fund can be able to do this across board. More importantly is the Pandemics Fund um, uh, we expect is going to build the capacity of countries themselves mm -hmm. so that when there is um, an outbreak, it is locals who are responding fast before even Africa CDC comes into the picture. When there is a disease threat, it is the local capacity that is identifying it, that is characterizing it and containing it even before help comes from outside. When the pandemic fund does this, it means that we'll be avoiding large outbreaks because we'll be arresting the outbreaks uh, when they are still small. It means we'll be delaying or completely avoiding uh, a pandemic. So um, we, we see the Pandemics Fund as filling a very uh, important void that is there in the global health architecture. And uh, we are going to work together with the, with the fund to make sure that Africa can be able to uh, fully benefit from this multilateral uh, uh, instrument for uh, financing and health. Our thanks to Dr. Ahmed Agwell Uma. Raj Kumar is the president and editor in chief at DevEx, a media platform for the global development community. Thank you so much for being here, Raj. Thank you, Noriana. Great to be with you. Well, in a moment, we'll look back at the week with him. But before we do, here's a reminder of some of the guests who've dropped into the zone. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm Shumati Shridhar with the World Bank Group. Our dream is a world free of poverty. All development is about people. Pretty cool, huh? Well, it's about to get even cooler. You don't want to mobilize uh, experts only when you have uh, an emergency. What we would like to see um, going forward is how do we do this um, with a much deeper integrated response to development. So we're in a position now where we know what works, right? right. And, and, you know, there's so much wealth in the world um, that there are resources available if we put it in, onto the right things. But we also know that if you focus too much on austerity, it's usually the women, the poor, the socially excluded who face the brunt of it. We interviewed 55,000 children from around the world wow. about what they want in the future. And they were spot on. They all said we need to do more about the climate crisis and inequality. Wow. But they want to believe in a better future. Mm -hmm. And I think as adults, sometimes we look about the future as how do we make it less bad? Yeah. They want a positive future and it's our role to get behind them and to do that. And maybe I have a question for you, which is oh. 
when I when I ask uh, young people about whether in 2050 we will manage to achieve this net zero emissions that we need to stabilize climate change, do you think we'll be able to make it? Do you think we'll get there? I think it's our only option. I, I think that's what drives a lot of the movement building and consensus and coalition work that is being done by grassroots and young people on the ground. And remember that poverty and climate change are not in competition in terms of our mission. They are two sides of the same coin. And especially in, in areas where there's war, migration or natural disasters, where you really need uh, a, a placeholder for education and you need hope and optimism for those people so that they can start planning their futures and being really, really engaged and have agency. I love the, 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 the women's empowerment coming from Yeah, that. and actually it's, the, it's not just empowerment. Yeah. It's, they already have it in them. We yes. just help. Helping them realize it? Exactly. So Raj, we have had some exciting guests and quite a range of them too. Yeah. Tell us based on what you've been hearing during the week, do you have any reflections on the atmosphere but also the substantive discussion that's been taking place? So I've been coming to these spring meetings for well over a decade. I can remember my first spring meetings and this is probably the most energized that I've seen it. And I think in part it's because there's a sense that what happens in these walls during these days is going to have real influence on the direction the bank takes. Right? There's a new president coming in, there's a whole new reform movement. So there's a sense of electricity in the atmosphere here that we are having conversations, not just in an academic way, we're not just pontificating, that real policy change is going to come out of this and that the world is at this kind of hinge point in history where the way these discussions go could really affect the future. A hinge point in history. Well said, Raj. And, and just to dive into some of the specific topics, uh, there's been some concern that widening the World Bank's mission to include a climate could come at the expense yep. of ending extreme poverty. Uh, to what extent are you seeing a recognition uh, from member countries that are here that um, addressing issues like climate change and providing greater support to middle income countries could actually be crucial to ending extreme poverty? I mean, I think of it as a false dichotomy, but I'm not sure everyone is there yet, right? There's still an open conversation. We, in fact, conducted a survey at DevEx of our audience and we asked them, what do they think about it? And just a little over a majority clearly see the connection. 53% said, we think focusing on climate will greatly help the development mission. But the rest, the almost half, don't entirely see that connection, right? And so I think there's still work to be done. I think a lot of that was done during these spring meetings. But there's work to be done to show the connection point and to explain what we mean by climate because often there's a thought that, well, this must be just about you know, converting cars or converting coal, uh, mitigation efforts in the, in the parlance of the technocrats here at the bank. But often what we're talking about in low-income countries is adaptation work. It's agriculture, it's education, it's health. And I think making that conversion in language is important. A lot of that happened this week, but there's probably still more work to do. Thank you for bringing that perspective in and hearing from this range of stakeholders is so important to us. And, and to that effect, the World Bank started its consultation on the evolution process uh, this week. Um, but there are also discussions outside of these walls. Uh, what are you hearing from some external stakeholders? Yeah, there have been probably more than ever outside events. We hosted some of them ourselves, you know, outside events, dinners, conferences on the, on the outskirts of this World Bank spring meetings, which I think is a good sign. It's a sign that you know, people are talking not just about the bank itself, but the implications of the bank's work on the wider world. And I think there is a lot of desire to see these reform movements really take place. And it's really just a question of how deep and how extreme they should go, all right? So you've got some people who are skeptical, saying we've got to go much further, much faster. You've got others who say, hey, hang on a second. There's a lot of priorities for the bank and, and the way it works traditionally has a lot of value. So there's a real conversation, a real debate happening out there outside the bank. And I think it's influencing what happens inside the bank. And it's a in really incredible moment. New president, new leadership coming in, new reform process happening. I've never seen as much attention on this institution in all the years we've been covering this at DevEx. Good to know, Raj. Thank you. And, and as you know, the annual meetings are also coming up this October in Marrakesh, Morocco. How do you think the conversation will have shifted by the time we reach October? Well, so the main thing that's going to be new is you'll have a new president here. Ajay Banga will be in the seat sometime you know, before June 30th or on June 30th. And he has been very careful going around this town saying, hey, look, careful with the expectations, right? I need some time to get into this role and make some reforms and changes. But I think by the time we get to Marrakesh, people inside the institution and outside will be looking for some kind of a new vision, some kind of an announcement. So we may not have an initiative or a tangible change in policy that's still quite soon from now, but I think a clear sense of direction. 
And so Marrakesh will be, in a way, the most substantive annual meeting in a long time because countries are going to be there expecting to see this is the line that we're going from here toward a new vision for the bank, a bank that is both a development bank and a climate bank. And that's a, a huge change. So we'll be in Marrakesh. I think a lot of eyes will be on what happens in Marrakesh. We'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for joining us, Raj, today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Noriana. And thank you for giving us this insight before the annual meetings in Marrakesh. And, and speaking of Marrakesh, yesterday we caught up with the Moroccan finance minister, Nadia Fetha, who told us how the country is preparing. We are really honored to, uh, to host this annual uh, meeting, first time after 15 years of Africa, first time after this, after this pandemic crisis that is happening outside uh, uh, Washington. But moreover, I think it's iconic, emblematic for the African continent. Uh, and it is in the vision of His Majesty that uh, we want to be part of the global conversation. And this global conversation is happening in October in challenging times. And hopefully it's going to be a great momentum to raise the voice of Africa, of mid-income countries. As Moroccans, uh, hopefully you will be visiting and you already saw that we, are, we offer a lot of hospitality. Yes. We have a strong tradition of hosting events. We have a long history and we will be more than happy to share it with our hosts. And hopefully they will make time to visit Marrakech, the surrounding of Marrakech. So much to go. So uh, we are getting prepared. We felt the pressure this week of how many details. <laughs> But we, the staff of IMF and World Bank, are helping a lot to get ready for October. Well, Greg Felder from the IFC has joined me, and as ever, he is monitoring the conversation on our social channels using the hashtag... Reshaping development, can't forget it. That's <laughs> right, Greg, well said. And uh, as you know, um, Greg has been monitoring the conversation, and we would love to hear about what's caught your attention mm -hmm. online. Yeah, no, it's been an active week online, uh, lots of discussion going on, and I really want to thank our online audience for being so engaged throughout the week uh, and sharing their thoughts. Even right now, I'm seeing comments come in uh, right here from India, uh, Nigeria, I see a comment here from Brazil, Spain, uh, France, Argentina, even in the U.S. Uh, and they're really ranging uh, on the topics that are being discussed. Like we mentioned earlier in the week, climate and economic growth are two of the key issues uh, people are discussing. But recently I've seen a lot also on education, health, and food security. Oh, that is quite a range. Could you mm -hmm. give us a flavor of the comments? Yeah, absolutely. Let's start uh, here on LinkedIn. I have a comment from Lal Bhatia. So Law Batia writes, the idea we must choose between investing in education, climate, health, or agriculture is a false dichotomy that limits our ability to address the complex and interconnected challenges facing the world today. In reality, these issues are all interrelated and must be tackled together to achieve sustainable and inclusive development. So thank you, Law, uh, for your comment there. And I have one more here on LinkedIn. This is from David Nar Aguda who writes, agriculture holds huge potential to guide countries out of poverty in Africa. 
Investing in agriculture will create jobs, generate much needed foreign currency. It will also feed the continent and lead to healthier populations and a be better quality of life for all people. Uh, and that's another comment there addressing some of these interconnected challenges that we mentioned from health uh, to agriculture. But also I saw a lot of posts online uh, from our digital media zone. So people were having fun at the selfie stage uh, using our development quest game uh, and posting pictures and photos online from the events. Thank you, and, and I was just struck by how thought-provoking and solutions-focused those comments were. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And um, I also understand you have the results of our poll question. Yes, yes. Earlier in the week, I mentioned to our online audience we would have a poll up, uh, and this poll is asking the question, what topic matters to you most at this spring meetings? Now, we gave the options of national debt. Is it climate change? Uh, is it trade and supply chains or health and education? Now, almost 20,000 of you voted online. This was on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and as you can see, climate change topped the polls, and I don't think that's any surprise all week that's been a consistent theme. No surprise there at all, Greg. And, and let me wrap it up by asking you for what is your key moment from this very exciting week? And I know it's hard to pick, so I'm putting you on a spot here, <laughs> yeah. but uh, oh, wow. what is the key moment for you? What stood out? You know, there was a lot of really good events, uh, but my favorite actually was the Empowering uh, Women Entrepreneurs event that featured Melinda Gates, uh, the finance minister from India, uh, our MD Maktardia from IFC. Um, they had some really good insights about the future of of um, us empowering women entrepreneurs. And what about you? Did you have anything that stood out? Oh, yes. I mean, yes, it's hard to pick, but I, yeah. I keep thinking of this idea of bringing stakeholders to the table. That's a theme throughout the meetings, but when you look at even complex topics like debt, um, bringing a range of stakeholders to the mm -hmm. table is a strength of the World Bank. Yes. And for example, we had the Sahel Ministerial on Sustainable Financing uh, that welcomed a range of creditors, um, a range of stakeholders, and of course, ministers of finance. So it was so cool to see these people talking to each other um, here in the World Bank. Yeah, that buildings. was a great week. I agree, and it's a perfect way to wrap it up as well. Thank you so much for being here, no, Greg. Thank you for having me. Okay, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this week in The Zone. We look forward to seeing you at the annual meeting.